So I wanna to talk to you about this amazing book. The Bell Jar is written by Sylvia Plath, who is one of the United States most like famous female authors. It is loosely based on her own life. So it's about this college student, her name is Esther, and she's doing this like dream internship in New York City with a fashion magazine. And it's, it's basically her dream come true. I mean like, oh my God, wow, you're writing for this incredible magazine. And it all seems so perfect. But when she gets there, she has all these mental health issues and she realizes that sometimes things are just not perfect, even when they're perfect. The novel is from 1951 and it touches on things that really now we talk about them openly, but in 1951 people, especially women, weren't talking about these things so openly. Some of these issues are women and their career, depression, mental health, sex, a young woman's prerogative to, to choose her own life. If you're a student and you're looking for major symbols in the novel, there are two huge symbols. And those are the bell jar itself, which is basically clinical depression. It's, it's the thing that sort of encompasses you and separates you from other people. And the fig tree, which is a representation of all the choices that we have sometimes and, and like you don't know what to pick. So when the novel opens, she's just arrived in New York and she's just about to start this super glamorous New York internship. And she's meeting all the other girls that are in the program. And it's supposed to be like super exciting, but something's wrong. <laughs> she feels disconnected, I guess, from everybody. It's, it's that bell jar thing again, where it's like, I see everybody, I'm surrounded by people, but I'm not really here. And all the things that are supposed to be super fun and exciting about being a college student in New York are not. And even though the job itself is uber glamorous, she realizes that she doesn't really know that this is what she wants. It's like, you won the lottery, you got this amazing position, right? And then it's like, I don't even know if I want this. And then you have all these parties and you're like, I don't even wanna be here. And there's all these guys and you're like, I don't even like these guys. Like, it's just kind of like, eh. But at the same time, she doesn't want to have these conventional roles, getting married and being a stay-at-home mom or being a secretary. She doesn't know where she fits in. So as I said, sex is a really big theme in the book. And that's because by virtue of her being female and of marrying age, her whole life is basically decided for her. Like her, how she's supposed to behave, what her goals are supposed to be, what she's supposed to be satisfied and fulfilled with. Every young woman is supposed to want to get married, supposed to want to have kids. So, so much of your life is being this perfect package, right? Presenting yourself in a way where you're a virgin and you're a nice, good girl because you need to get that nice, good boy so that he can give you this perfect life. And then you'll be happy because that's how you're happy. Now, there are a few men that come into her life throughout the course of the story. And one of the major guys in her life is Buddy. Buddy is perfect. He's attractive. He's athletic he's like the perfect 1950s guy but she feels like he's so perfect and he's just so wow like he, she puts him on a pedestal you know like the guy that you love from afar and like you could never be good enough for him but later on when she actually gets to know him she realizes yeah, like you're not that great and I don't even want you <laughs> and that's a theme I mean it's it's literally just like her internship like oh my god this looks so perfect and this is amazing blah 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 and then once I have it and I see the nitty-gritty of it uh, it's not that awesome right so the same thing happens with buddy to be fair though the way that she's been taught to perceive romance or or the promise of this perfect marriage it's it's so idealistic it's like so much on a pedestal that there I don't I mean there's no way for him to compete with that and she's just learning this because she doesn't have experience with men. And so she just has all these fantasies, right? And whatever society has been feeding her, like the fairy tale, the Disney fairy tale, when she's getting to know a guy, she's like, oh, not so good, you know? But what's interesting is that everyone else around her thinks that he's like the best catch. It's almost like you're lucky that he's even looking at you. So for example, his mother at one point says that women are just there to 
basically support men while they go out into the world and achieve their dreams and are ambitious and, you know, take the world by storm, right? And Esther's like, well, but I, like, I want to take the world by storm. Like, I, I have ambitions too. And so these are the kinds of things that she's realizing as she is interacting with this guy for the first time in her life. In fact, Buddy actually tells her that her interest in writing is just going to disappear once she gets married because, like, why would you keep writing or, you know, pursuing any hobbies that are especially intellectual ones once you're married, right? Like, the marriage should fulfill all of your desires. And so she's really struggling, okay, because she's trying to want what she's supposed to want, but it's not working following the theme of sex one of the issues that she has like real issues with is that you know her whole life she's been taught like you know you don't have sex before marriage and then she finds out like yeah he's had sex before marriage and it was not in like a committed relationship and it was not love and it wasn't romantic or anything pretty it was just wham bam thank you ma'am and and nobody looks at him any different like it's and it's okay because he's a guy. The hypocrisy of that hits her hard. Not only that, but there's this scene, to me it was funny, uh, like where they, they seem to be, you know, getting a little close, like maybe, maybe they're actually gonna have sex finally. And it's such a downer. Like he's not passionate, like he, he's so, he's boring. Like he is sexually boring. And when she, <laughs> she sees him naked and she's thinking of turkey gizzards and she's like, uh, like, is that what this whole thing has been leading up to? Like, wow, yeah, kind of a letdown. So <laughs> there's that and she's just like, nah, it's okay. And so they don't do anything. <laughs> it's a series of disappointing discoveries. He's not the perfect guy. He's not your Prince Charming coming to save you on a white horse. He is not a good boy that is saving himself for marriage. And he is not sexy and he does not look good naked. So Esther just becomes a little bit obsessed with losing her virginity. And she says that she wants to have the same freedom that men have. There is an interesting scene later on in the book uh, where she sees a lesbian couple like making out and she freaks out because this goes against how she's been raised in 1951. When she talks to her doctor about it, she mentions and she asks the doctor, like, why would a woman be with another woman? The doctor answers tenderness. It's a contrast because just something interesting. It's the only time where tenderness is associated with sex. And it's when, when there is no man involved at all. It just kind of gives you a little bit of insight into how Esther slash Sylvia Plath is perceiving the, the relationships, right, between men and women. She does meet a couple of other guys that are completely different. She meets a, a guy called Constantine and he's not a, a really a romantic interest. I mean, they, they barely spend time together, but they do go out and they have fun and he's, he's really nice and he's great at conversation and he's interesting and he seems interested in her and she's thinking, this is perfect, right? I'm gonna lose my virginity to this guy and then he doesn't make a move. So like, what happened, right? And then she meets this other guy at a party who is a misogynist and he's not interested in her as a human being at all. And in fact, attacks her and like tries to rape her and she flips out. So you have these two polar opposites. She doesn't find that passion, that desire and virility with the tenderness and the conversation and the kindness. She, she can't seem to find that in one package. So again, there's this idea that you can't have it all. You can't have the career and the man. And then with men, it's like, you can't have the nice guy and also have the guy that takes initiative and takes control and all of these things. They, it's like one or the other and to the extremes. Eventually, when she does lose her virginity, it has nothing to do with the guy. In, in all of these pursuits, in all of these dates, it's never been about the guy. It's about her letting go of this burden. She, she even says like, I never wanna see you again. It's like, you, you did what you were supposed to do and like, goodbye now. So in a way that's very liberating for her because this whole time there has been a feeling of desperation and finding a partner and being married and, and all of this stuff. Another major, major 
major theme in the book is depression. Now, Sylvia Plath did deal with clinical depression. If you know about her life, you know that she committed suicide and she tried several times before the last time. She tried even when she was very, very young. And some of the suicidal attempts that Esther makes in the book are very, very close to things that Sylvia actually did. Now, the interesting thing about the way that Sylvia writes Esther's experiences is that you see how the depression progresses little by little and it's almost like going down a drain. First of all, it's not presented as sadness, which a lot of people think that being depressed, you're gonna feel sad, but not really. You, you just feel detached somebody pulled the plug. That's that bell jar again. Throughout the book, Esther over and over and over again uh, talks about feeling like, like when she talks, it's someone else talking for her. And like, if she goes somewhere, her body is going somewhere without her. Like she is not there. She's not really connecting with her environment. She's just going through the motions of life. Eventually you see other signs of depression, like crying and not being able to sleep. One of, it's so amazing, well, it's so interesting to me is, is seeing what psychiatric care was like at the time, especially for women. For a long time in psychiatry, women were considered just neurotic. Like, you know, oh, well, you know, you're a woman, you're just this pile of nerves <laughs> and that's it. And then we just need to fix you and just sit down, calm down and behave. Eventually when she is referred to a psychiatrist, that's exactly what happens. Like she meets this doctor, male, he barely listens to her. He has her go for these electric shock treatments. And what's interesting is he doesn't even ask her what she thinks about it. He asked her mom, it's, it's this total disregard for her and her experience of this whole thing. In Dr. Gordon, the first psychiatrist that we see, we see this lack of compassion and lack of interest in patients with clinical depression and maybe specifically women with clinical depression. When he puts her into the hospital afterwards, and we see how her mother reacts to that. We see another side of how people react to clinical depression and that's the embarrassment. Like her mother is ashamed that her daughter has these suicidal thoughts. She sees it as an embarrassment and it's just like, just get happy. Like what's wrong with you? Just behave. Meanwhile, Esther's mind is going in this spiral and she's, listening to these thoughts that are more and more often talking about suicide and, and making it sound more and more reasonable. When you see the thoughts that she has, it's it's incredibly realistic and it's very interesting the way that Sylvia Plath writes it because she almost, she approaches her suicide in a very logical, cold way. There are times where the way that she explains it is not even like she wants to actually die. It's more like she wants to turn her mind off and the only way to do it is to shut her body off she's going through it like a checklist like she's just planning and again there's that detachment of emotion that detachment of what's actually happening like what you're actually doing and she tries different things so obviously she's already in therapy and she's had the electric shock treatments she also tries volunteering and she tries religion and none of it is working she's still in, under the bell jar. The first time when we actually start seeing improvement is when she gets a different doctor at a different hospital who encourages her to connect with how she really feels. She's asking her to be honest about her feelings, about what she needs, right? And she starts mourning her father who had died when she was little, just like Sylvia's dad died when she was little. and actually crying and, and and grieving for him, which she hadn't been allowed to do because she was supposed to behave and be a perfect little girl. She eventually acknowledges how frustrating her mother is with her criticisms and her expectations and her lack of understanding, all, you know, all of those things. She actually allows herself to say like, I hate my mom, which is of course, not a nice thing to say, but sometimes things need to be said. Uh, at least to yourself, at least you punch a pillow, something, just kind of get it out. And so when she starts doing that, we do see an improvement. So she starts facing a few facts. Once she starts getting real with herself, things start getting better. But what I like is that when Sylvia Plath ends the book, she she's not presenting it in an 
unrealistic way where you think like, oh, she's totally cured and everything is great and now it's like a Disney ending. Esther's a lot better. She's ready to live her life, whatever that may be. She's a much more mature person, a lot stronger. She's a lot more honest with herself. That's a big deal. But she also recognizes that the bell jar can come back at any time. And so there's this idea here that she's gonna have to learn to recognize it for what it is when it comes instead of getting lost in other people's expectations and deluding herself. Like she's gonna have to actually be brave enough to recognize it and deal with it head on and maybe get through it better that way. It's such an amazing book and obviously the topics are really heavy, but I think it's incredible. And even though this was written like 70 years ago, the experience of clinical depression continues to be very common. And it's something that people are talking about a lot more readily now. And when you read books like this, it gives you a little bit of insight into the disease. And it also gives you an insight into how we as a country have dealt with it in the past. So it's really well written, man. I mean, woof, it is well written. I cannot resist putting in some of my favorite quotes because she's so freaking good. Like, oh, I love Sylvia Plath. I hope you learned something and maybe you'll check it out uh, at some point. All right, see you next time.